that when you're working up the patient, you know what's normal so that if it doesn't fall within the tight definition of normal, you punt to the doctor and the doctor diagnoses. So a real cautious approach to take when you're working up your patients is to look for normal rather than look for abnormal. Normal for pupils is that they constrict equally. They are within a millimeter in size of one another in ambient light and hippus is normal. Hippus is a bilateral symmetrical unrest in the size of the pupils under steady illumination. It's a normal reflex which diminishes as we age. So it's more prominent in younger people. So what's not normal for pupils? More than a millimeter difference in size, not normal. Out of round, not normal. If during the swinging flashlight test, you see initial dilation when you swing over to a pupil, that is not normal. If your pupils respond differently to one another, either during the direct light response testing or the consensual light response testing. That is not normal. This is a salient point. Pupil assessment is a comparative test. You're comparing the relative strengths of signals in one eye versus the other. Therefore, if everything is normal in both eyes, you're gonna see the exact same thing in both eyes. So you're looking for symmetry when you check pupils. If you see anything that is not symmetrical, that's a red flag. Have the patient fixate on a distant, non-accommodative fixation target. Dim your room lights. You must use a bright test light and you must have a pupil gauge. The reason we have our patient look at a distant, non-accommodative fixation target is because of something called the near reflex triad. These are three things that happen automatically when you look at something up close. First of all, your lens accommodates. That's the crystalline lens inside your eye. It changes shape to bring things into focus. Also, your eyes converge. That means that they come towards one another. And the third part of the near reflex triad is pupillary constriction. It's this last component of the near reflex triad, which is why we have to give them a distant non-accommodative fixation target when we check pupils. If they don't look at a non-accommodative distant target, we're gonna start off with pupils that are already constricted due to the near reflex. Why make our jobs harder than they have to be, right? One of the ways we make pupil assessment easier is by starting off with the largest pupil that we can. And the way we do that is by using a darkened room and a non-accommodating distant fixation target. This will get you the briskest response possible. Anisocoria means the patient has more than a millimeter difference in size between their two pupils in ambient light. Now you might see the phrase across the top of the slide here that says ants on the cornea. I have a funny story about that. Early in my career, we were on call and one of our technicians was scribing and she came out from the room and she told all of us techs in the tech station, there's a patient in room two with ants on their cornea. And we were all befuddled trying to figure out how in the world that could happen. And pretty soon the doctor came out and we said, Doc, what's up with that patient who has ants on their cornea? And the doctor looked at us like we were crazy. She said, ants on the cornea? That patient has anisocoria. The doctor had dictated to the scribe anisocoria and the technician who didn't know what that was wrote under cornea, ants on the cornea. So of course we all got a big kick out of that. But it's not ants on the cornea, it's anisocoria. So this is a difference in the size of the two pupils of more than one millimeter in ambient lighting conditions. Let's talk about some conditions that can cause anisocoria. Horner syndrome can be acquired or congenital. Congenital is benign, so there's no disease process going on. 
acquired is not benign. There is a disease process going on and it's very important to never miss a Horner syndrome. What you'll see in a Horner syndrome is you'll see an anisocoria, you'll see a totic lid on the side with a smaller pupil, and their anisocoria will be greater in dim light. They'll have less of an anisocoria with the lights on. Whenever you see an anisocoria, you should always measure the pupils with the lights on and the lights off and document it on the chart. Acquired Horner syndrome can be caused by lung cancer, carotid artery aneurysms, neck or chest trauma or surgery, and it's very important to never miss a Horner syndrome. So again, they will have an anisocoria and the smaller pupil will have a totic lid. They may also not have sweating on the side of their face with the totic lid. Congenital Horner syndrome will have a totic lid on the side with the smaller pupil. They'll have an anisocoria, and additionally, they'll have a heterochromia, meaning they'll have two different color irises. Typically, the lighter colored iris is on the side with the totic lid and the small pupil. Third cranial nerve palsy has an anisocoria greater with the bright lights on. So they'll have less of an anisocoria with dim lights. They'll have a totic lid on the side with the larger pupil. Now the pupil is not always involved on a third cranial nerve palsy. Diabetic third cranial nerve palsies usually will not have pupil involvement. If the pupil is involved though, typically the pupil will be mid dilated five to six millimeters. They also may have a dysmotility. Typically their eye will be deviated down and out. An 80s tonic pupil will have a large anisocoria like the picture here, but they will not have a totic lid. If you see an anisocoria and no lid ptosis, you should think 80s tonic pupil. Siderosis bulbi is where the patient has a retained iron foreign body and it rusts in their eye. It can cause an anisocoria as well as a heterochromia. The eye with the retained iron foreign body typically will have a, a darker colored iris. Trauma can cause anisocoria, as can pharmacologic agents, myadriatics, myotics, cycloplegics, and illicit drugs. And then finally, there's physiologic anisocoria, which means that that's just the way that they were born. If they have an anisocoria, turn on the room lights and measure the pupil size and turn them off. Patients whose anisocoria varies in the amount of lighting are more suspect of having a pathologic origin. If the patient has an anisocoria, make note of the lid position and the iris color. This is because a totic lid can be present in patients with Horner syndrome and third cranial nerve palsies. Also, heterochromia can be present if a patient has congenital Horner syndrome. Irregularly shaped pupils can be caused by surgery, synechia, and trauma. Synechia occurs when there's intraocular inflammation. The iris becomes adherent to the anterior lens or the posterior cornea. The mnemonic PERLA stands for pupils equal, round, respond to light, and accommodation. When checking the direct pupillary light response, you should see a brisk constriction to a minimum size, followed by a slight relaxation to an intermediate size. This might be followed by hippus, that state of unrest in the size of the pupil under steady illumination. The amount of constriction and relaxation you see depends upon how bright your room light is and how bright your test light is. 
When doing the swinging flashlight test, you're going to alternately shine the light in one eye and then the other. Quickly shift from one eye to the other. You should spend two to three times as long on each eye as it takes you to shift, and you should shift in less than a second. The bottom line take home message is that if you have a patient with normal pupils, you will see the exact same characteristics in both eyes. Remember, pupil assessment is a comparative test. You're comparing the relative strengths of signals in one eye versus the other. Therefore, if everything is normal, you'll see the exact same thing in both eyes. You're looking for symmetry when you check pupils. So now I'm measuring her pupils and what you want to do is you want to aim your light at their chin and then just slightly tilt it up so you have a nice glow of their face and use a pupil gauge so you can measure them exactly. So I am estimating her right pupil is eight and a half millimeters. Her left pupil is also about eight and a half millimeters. Actually, her re combination is relaxing. Yeah, about eight and a half millimeters. And they're both round. Then I'm going to do the direct light response. Here I'm going from no light to light to watch the pupil constrict. I'm making a mental note of the briskness or latency of the response, meaning sluggishness, either whether it's brisk or sluggish, the minimum size and the size that escapes too. I do not have to think millimeters here at all. I'm simply making a movie in my head of what I see because I'm going to then take my light away from OD, give her pupils a moment to recover, then I'm going to go to OS, do the same thing, and I should see the exact same movie replayed. Awesome. They're both equally brisk. They both constrict to about the same size and relax to about the same size. Remember when you're checking pupils, you're looking for symmetry. In the normal pupil exam, you'll see the exact same thing in both eyes. Now I'm going to do the swinging flashlight test. This is to check for an afferent pupillary defect or a Marcus Gunn pupil. In this test, the timing or cadence is critical. I want you to spend about two to three times as long on each pupil as it takes to shift. You're going to quickly shift between the two eyes. It should take you less than a second to get from one pupil to the other. And what I teach techs to think in their heads is this. A thousand one, a thousand one, a thousand one, a thousand one. This is the proper timing and cadence. I'm spending two to three times as long on each eye as it takes to switch. I'm switching very quickly. And what I'm looking for here is I'm looking to see if there is any dilation when I swing over. Neither people is dilating. Both people's constrict slightly and relax slightly. That's what you want to see on a normal swinging flashlight test. You definitely want to make sure you don't see any dilation when you swing over there. And remember, you're looking for symmetry, so both people should be doing the exact same thing.